Um, just to get started, I thought I would go over what has been learned about CHARGE syndrome since the original description of this condition back in 1981. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the diagnosis, some genetics, and some research that is going on both in our laboratory and others. And uh, as Susan said, please feel free to interrupt me. We have um, an hour for this talk, but I could stand up here for five or six hours. Um, so you might want to stop me at some point if I start to ramble or I get too excited or you start to fall asleep. So let's kick this off. Uh, first of all, for disclosures, as Susan mentioned, I am chair of the Scientific Advisory Board of the CHARGE Syndrome Foundation. And in that role, I help the foundation make decisions about um, how to spend their money. And part of that decision making goes into investing in programs and projects, and I know the foundation is really interested in supporting the clinic at Cincinnati and interested in supporting research that goes on in all of the laboratories and clinics that uh, have invested in CHARGE syndrome. So it's been a real honor to be a part of that. I'm also a parent of a child with CHARGE, and uh, I really got into this when my son was born. I was a second year medical student at the University of Michigan, and uh, he was born um, and was diagnosed with CHARGE syndrome at around the age of six months. And by that time, he had already had uh, two congenital heart disease repairs. He had been diagnosed with severe hearing loss, and he had been diagnosed with uh, ocular colobomas. So we learned about the diagnosis of CHARGE syndrome from a very astute clinician who at the time recognized those features and provided us with that diagnosis. Um, at the time, I had planned to do neurology because I had studied neuroscience for my doctoral training and was on the path to become a, an adult neurologist. Well, all of that changed when Noam, our son, was born, and um, I began my other career of raising a child with CHARGE syndrome. So this is Noam after his, uh, I think, second heart surgery. Uh, he went on to learn how to read. Um, he enjoyed swimming on the patio in our backyard. Um, he uh, loves participating in holidays, Le loved wearing his helmet throughout school, which protected him from several falls that he had. Um, graduated from fifth grade, loves going to Tigers games. He's an avid sports fan. He knows more about Michigan football than anyone I've ever met. He's a great traveler. This is him graduating from high school. Um, this is him going to prom. That was a very special event. And he graduated from college this past spring. So we've been very fortunate to have Noam in our lives for multiple reasons, and he has brought great joy to our family. And I couldn't be more proud of his accomplishments. Uh, this is a picture of my husband, Yoash Raphael, who's also my clinical and research collaborator, and our daughter, Maya, who's working on the Hill this summer. So I'm happy to share with you our personal journey uh, knowing CHARGE syndrome, at least in the setting of our family. And also, I dedicated my professional career to CHARGE in the sense of uh, learning about genetics and becoming a clinical geneticist, and now working in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Michigan as interim chair. And I also want to put a shout out to Dan and the organizers of Cincinnati Children's Hospital, because as Teresa Troop mentioned, they have put together what many families in Michigan really dreamed would happen. And I apologize personally for not rising to that occasion because I'm a clinician and, you know, if I could have built what Cincinnati built, I would have done it, but instead I chose to focus on research because that's really where my heart lies. So let's step back for a few minutes and just remember that CHARGE syndrome is a multiple sensory deprivation condition. It is really the only disorder that I'm aware of that affects all the senses. Vision, hearing, taste, balance, pain sensation, tactile touch, olfaction or, or sense of smell. And in that setting, the challenges that people face with CHARGE syndrome are truly unique. Not only are they unique compared to other people, but they're also unique compared to people who have the same condition. So like some people will say, if you've met a child with CHARGE syndrome, you've met a child with CHARGE syndrome. You can't really compare one to the next to the next, uh, at least on a global scale. You can look at individual features, but it's really hard to, to lump them together as a single entity. So how have we and others 
thought about charge syndrome over the years. I just want to carry you through the way I think about approaches to research and understanding and exploring charge. Back in the day when charge syndrome was a clinical condition described by the constellation of features that it presents with, coanal atresia, hearing loss, vision loss, heart uh, conditions, people started to think of it as an association and that led to a more uh, defined understanding of it being a syndrome. And a syndrome simply means that it's thought to occur by a single um, origin, a single cause. So in genetics, we think of syndromes as things that you can assign to an underlying problem in the genes, either a change in a gene or a change in multiple genes. But syndromes can also occur from exposures to certain medications. So syndrome just means individual cause for multiple features that present in people, okay? So back in, um, you know, before 2004, when the gene for charge was identified, people started looking at families where there was more than one person with charge affected, asking whether it, it was a genetic disorder, and if so, could we find the underlying gene that caused it? And they did this by carefully characterizing patients with charge syndrome and their families and looking for genes. And we were part of those early uh, gene hunts. We had a gene that we were really interested in and um, we were wrong, so we published that anyway. But then in 2004, the gene for charge was identified, CHD7, which I'm sure you all know about. So this identification of genetic disease through family studies was really critical. And it's interesting to think about the history of how CHD7 was identified, which is another lecture on its own. But carefully looking at family structures and how people were presenting with charge was, was really critical in understanding this as a genetic disease. And if we had been gathering in this room uh, back in 2000, we still wouldn't have known, is this a genetic disorder or not? So keep in mind that the field has come a long way in terms of understanding the genetic underpinnings of CHARGE syndrome. So that gene discovery was um, a landmark uh, uh, discovery back in 2004. Once the gene was identified, people started asking whether you could model CHARGE syndrome in animals. So our lab and others started making mice with CHARGE syndrome. Um, and my husband used to say, you know, you're the only person in the world who has made a mouse and a son with CHARGE syndrome. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I guess that's true. So I'll take credit for that. <laughs> um, but we learned, because we knew what the gene was, that you could study the function of that gene in mice, in zebrafish, which are just called zebrafish because they have fancy stripes on them, but they're very small fish that you can use in the laboratory for genetic studies. And there were flies that had already been studied with mutations in a gene called Kismet, which is similar to CHD7. In fact, the CHD7 gene has been around since yeast. So it's conserved way back in evolution um, a long time. So there were a lot of tools that could be developed to study CHD7. And then having the animal models in place, people could start asking about how this particular gene functions in embryos, in cells, in developing ears, and to start to do some physiology work on these animal models to help us understand humans with CHARGE syndrome. Um, once you have the underlying mechanisms, you can ask questions about drug development and treatment and then use those drugs to go back to the families and apply what you know to the families. So this paradigm is, is just a general approach to how I think about exploring genetic mechanisms in charge. I want to share with you um, a timeline because I've been mentioning several things uh, along the way. The first clinical report for CHARGE was in 1979. I think the term CHARGE was coined back in 1981 as an association. Um, my son was born, that's when I started to get involved in this. The syndrome was uh, first used or published back in 1999. The CHD7 gene was discovered in 2004. Um, animal, animal models started to emerge after that. Um, and then Many people have been asking these questions about pathogenesis. So how does this protein function in cells, in organisms, and how does dysfunction of this protein lead to what we see in people with CHARGE syndrome? 
Uh, IPS cell stands for induced pluripotent cells, and these are cells that we and others have made by taking skin cells from people who have charge and turning them into stem cells and studying them in dishes. I won't talk much about that. But here we are today in 2018 um, looking toward the future. So one of the things I'm going to talk about is how we arrive at an even more comprehensive diagnosis because that's been one of my long-standing dreams is to solve or understand the entirety of CHARGE syndrome. We know now that up to two-thirds or maybe even more of people who have clinical features of CHARGE syndrome will have a change in the CHD7 gene. But what about those other people who don't have that identified genetic change? Can we solve those cases and can we learn more about what's causing CHARGE syndrome in those individuals? And then I think ultimately it's not um, too far-fetched to consider the possibility of regenerative therapies. What can be done to restore hearing, to restore vision in people who are lacking those skills or have impairments in those areas? And you know, this may not happen in my lifetime, but whatever we can do to promote this uh, will make me very happy. Um, great. So this is the outline for the next six hours. <laughs> um, okay, maybe not, you'll have to cut me off. Uh, what I want to do is talk about the diagnosis uh, briefly. I'll go into some of the genetics of CHD7 and CHARGE syndrome, and then a few research topics. I want to share with you some of the excitement around the mouse models that we've developed. I want to show you the power of um, analyzing one particular organ. That's the inner ear that we've tended to focus on more than others. Um, I'll tell you some of the work going on with CHD7 and retinoic acid. Uh, and what we've learned about studying those signaling pathways. We have some very exciting new data that are about to be published uh, on taking single cells from the inner ear and studying them in culture, and then future directions and unanswered questions. And again, if I start rambling and, you know, if, if you lose me or I lose you, just interrupt me and we can have some dialogue in the middle of this, okay? Because I get really excited about this and I tend to lose myself. All right, so we all know CHARGE syndrome is the acronym which has withstood the test of time. It was a very good acronym. Tim, I don't know if you were involved in the original conversations around this, but those brilliant uh, physicians who came up with this acronym uh, really deserve some credit because it's a great word, I think. Um, coloboma of the eye, heart defects, atresia of the coeni, which I always have to explain to people, but you all know is the space between the mouth and the nose. Um, retardation of growth and development, genital hypoplasia with pubertal delay, uh, and then the ear malformations, semicircular canal uh, abnormalities, sensory neural, and sometimes conductive hearing loss, and external ear deformities. So um, what, what's interesting, I think one of the most fascinating things about CHARGE syndrome is the variety of features that you see in people with CHARGE. And what we're learning now is that people can have true charge syndrome and have a very small subset of these features. Um, and, and the variety of the way in which these um, features present, I think, is, is going to occupy us for some time. We were fortunate enough to organize uh, an entire issue of the American Journal of Medical Genetics this past year. And if you're interested in a very deep dive into 12 different areas of charge syndrome, including a very nice article that Tim and his group wrote on behaviors in charge, another paper on the endocrine features, another paper on um, uh, immune, immune abnormalities, neurology. It's all in, I mean, the, the, what I can think of as the most up-to-date information is in this issue in the American Journal. So that's a shameless plug for a really nice uh, issue that we put together this past year. Meg Hefner, who many of you know, um, presented this in the article that she prepared on CHARGE syndrome, and you can see some typical facial features um, with asymmetry of the face. She points out the, creasing, the creases on the hands, there's a hockey stick crease, and then the characteristic external ears that present with CHARGE. Now, um, in the article that Connie Van ravenswijk Arts and I put together, Connie and I were co-editors of this issue, um, we collected the um, experience of features in CHARGE syndrome and how often they were reported. And you can see that one of the more common features is the external ears, um, another the semicircular canal abnormalities, 
ocular coloboma in about 80% of individuals. Coanal atresia is actually less common, despite the fact that it was one of the first clinical features to be recognized in association with CHARGE syndrome, which I find rather interesting. Only about half of people have coanal atresia. Another 40% have clefting of the lip or palate. Cranial nerve dysfunction is very common, partly because it is a broad category of conditions. It includes uh, both the hearing loss and the eye problems, but also includes the facial asymmetry, uh, facial palsy, uh, problems with uh, swallowing and coordination of the oromotor uh, area. Um, anosmia, or reduced sense of smell, is extremely common. Genital hypoplasia, congenital heart defects, abnormalities of the chest area, organs, tracheoesophageal uh, abnormalities. Developmental delay is incredibly common, but it's also a broad uh, diagnosis. Um, intellectual disability uh, and growth retardation. So um, we could talk for a long time about the features of CHARGE. Um, I'm gonna just pause for a minute and ask you all if I missed anything in terms of the features. I know I have, just on that list. Are there features that, that are not encompassed there that you've seen? Yes. GI problems. GI problems, thank you. Problems with um, constipation, diarrhea, reflux, malrotation, yep, yeah. Genital urinary reflux, yep. And I think also renal anomalies didn't necessarily make it there. Yep, thank you. Athymia, yep, absolutely. And there is a lot of overlap between CHARGE syndrome and 22Q11 deletion syndrome, um, which also presents with athymia. And actually the immune deficiencies in CHARGE syndrome are not as well understood. We had people asking us about uh, use of our mice. Several labs have used our mice to specifically study the immune system, but haven't uncovered anything meaningful yet. Anybody else want to add anything? Vestibular, yep. I would tend to think of those as related to the inner ear, but um, one, it's hard to know how much the vestibular problems are specific to the ear versus the cerebellum, which is also affected commonly in CHARGE syndrome and is a very important motor coordination center. Yep, anybody else? Yes. Right, yeah, torticollis, hypotonia, absolutely. And oftentimes, if you have torticollis, um, people attribute it to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. But uh, we've observed, and my son also has uh, cervical vertebral abnormalities. So the vertebral abnormalities are very common in the neck area and also throughout the spine and can lead to scoliosis. Clipple file, yep, yep. I think the definition of clipple file is the cer cervical vertebral abnormalities. Yep. David. Yes. Right, musculoskeletal and um, yeah, hypotonia. So we've covered basically the whole body, right? <laughs> so everything can be affected. Um, and there are themes, but it, it's fascinating to think about how this one gene can lead to such a variety of features and affect so many different organ systems. Okay, so we've talked about CHD7. This is the gene that was um, identified back in 2004 to be causative for CHARGE syndrome. And again, it explains the vast majority of people with CHARGE syndrome, but not everybody. And we do still think of CHARGE syndrome as a monogenic or single gene disorder. This is a cartoon which shows you the gene structure. And what's shown here in the white rectangles and squares here are what are called exons. So if you think of a gene, um, in this case for CHD7, it spans 188,000 base pairs, but only about 1% of that ever gets turned into protein. So the exons are the part of the gene that eventually make it into protein. And the way this works is the DNA gets transcribed into RNA, and RNA gets made into protein. So this 188 kilobases of DNA gets turned into nine kilobases of RNA, 
sorry, 27,000 bases of RNA, which gets turned into, no wait, 188 KB, 9 KB of cDNA or RNA, and that gets made into a protein that is 3,000 amino acids long. So at each step in the processing from gene to protein, you lose information, if you will. So if your child had CHD7 sequencing done, what probably happened is the lab took some blood or a cheek swab from your child and sequenced or looked at the individual base pairs for all of those 38 exons in this gene. They did not look at the rest of the 188 minus 9 kilobases of DNA because that part of the genome is called the non-coding area because it doesn't code for protein. And the reason they didn't look at it is because we don't really understand it yet. It's full of what are called junk DNA or regulatory regions, regions of the genome that we really don't understand. They might contribute to whether the gene is turned off or on, how it interacts with other genes, but this part of the genome, which actually comprises 99% of the DNA, is ignored. And that's okay, right? We don't understand it, so why would we sequence it in patients that we have to give information back to for the clinic? But the reason I point this out and why it gets me excited is in that 99% of DNA is a lot of information that we are now going to be able to learn and look at because we have the technologies to start addressing it. So some of the work that we're and others are doing is looking at that 99% and trying to figure it out. What's shown here in the cartoon also is how this gene does get turned into protein and what the protein looks like. And I won't belabor this too much right now, but these um, acronyms here stand for various functions that the protein has when it works in cells. So, you know, cells have an outer membrane and then they have an inner membrane which uh, contains the nucleus. The CHD7 protein functions in the nucleus not in the cytoplasm, to regulate DNA and chromatin. We'll talk about that next, well, in a minute. So these individual colored regions of the protein have specific functions because there are specific protein domains that enable those functions. This is a slide to basically summarize. If you take all of the known changes in the CHD7 gene that have been associated with CHARGE syndrome, this is how they distribute. Most of them are what are called nonsense, so they disrupt the function of the protein. Another 35% are frame shift, so they shift the way that DNA gets turned into RNA and protein, which also renders the protein non-functional in most cases. There are missense mutations, which are misspellings, and interestingly, people who have missense changes do tend to be either more mildly affected or have um, slightly different features. Not everybody, but in general, missense mutations behave slightly differently than what would be called loss of function, or those nonsense and frame shift mutations. Splice site mutations, I'll just show you this cartoon again. Splicing is the phenomenon whereby these exons come together at the level of the RNA that get made into protein. So splicing is, is really the joining of these individual exons, and you can have misspellings at the edges of these exons that are called splice site mutations. And what happens is if you have, for example, a mutation right here at the edge of exon two, the splicing machinery might take this exon and instead of attaching it to exon three, it might attach it to exon seven. And when that happens, you can imagine that the reading of the protein that results from that is entirely different than you would expect it to be in the normal situation. So splice site mutations can also be unusual because what they may do is create a new protein that doesn't normally exist in nature. Um, and then deletions and duplications are far less common. Um, but the index case with CHARGE syndrome, which led to the discovery of the gene, was a child with a large deletion that encompassed CHD7. That's a fascinating story. Okay, any questions about the genetics of, the, of CHD7? Um, I live and breathe this, so I wanna make sure that I'm not, yeah, letting being clear, yeah.
HD7 gene and having that mutation affect so many <laughs> different areas of the body or some other genes, you know, syndromes can be missing and, and you have just a lung disorder. So I don't know if everybody could hear the question. She's asking really how is it that CHD7 can affect so many organ systems and, and be specific in the way it affects those organ systems? Is that correct? Correct. I don't know. I, I think it's a fascinating question. And it's one that we're really interested in and many people are asking. Um, because if we understood specifically how CHD7 functions in the various tissues and organ systems where it's expressed, then we might be able to intervene early or modify how it's functioning in those cells and tissues. I'll see if I can answer your question a little bit, but I don't fully know the answer. It's a really good question. So this is how we think CHD7 works in cells. Again, it functions in the nucleus, and in the nucleus you have, you know, um, DNA which could take the length of a football field that has to be compacted in something the size of a few microns. So all of that DNA has to get bundled up together like a ball of yarn in the nucleus. So shown here in this uh, cartoon, can, can you see my cursor? I don't know. Okay, I've been pointing and you haven't been able to see. All right. At the lower left is this ball of yarn. So that's going to be the combination of DNA and protein that make up what we call chromatin. And it's all condensed in the nucleus. But in order for that chromatin to work, it has to be unwound. And that's really where CHD7 and related proteins come in because it unwinds that DNA and chromatin into what are called nucleosomes. So if you've read any of the literature in charge, you might have heard this word nucleosome. What a nucleosome is, is basically a stretch of DNA that is wrapped around what are called histone proteins. And they're very characteristic proteins. And they create these little, they sort of look like disc structures if you look at uh, scientific publications. I'm sure they don't look like that in real life. But they're called beads on a string. And as the DNA and chromatin unwind, those nucleosomes get stretched out to the point that you have open DNA, which can then be turned into protein, RNA and protein. So because CHD7 is a chromatin remodeler, it acts to either unwind or compact all of that DNA in the nucleus. And you can imagine that that function is really essential for determining whether a gene gets turned on or off, a different gene, not CHD7. Does that make sense? So that's how I tend to think of this protein, is critical for these very early but um, essential mechanisms of opening or closing DNA and thereby determining whether genes get turned on or off. Okay? Now, um, when CHD7 was identified, it was already known that there were other members of this protein family, and we know now that there are at least nine. They're grouped into three different subfamilies based on the commonalities of the different protein domains that are present. So all of these nine CHD proteins will have what are called chromodomains that bind to DNA. They have um, other domains that do that unwinding or compacting. And then this family of which CHD7 is a member, the, the third family, have SANT domains and BRK domains. And those domains are not as well understood, but they're thought to interact, mediate how CHD7 interacts with other proteins in general. Okay, now, whoops, um, you asked about CHD7's function in the syndrome and how it can be so specific. Well, we wanted to know like I mentioned earlier, what is the cause of charge in people who don't have a CHD7 mutation? So our group, along with Stephanie Bilas, began collecting human uh, samples at the charge meetings last summer and the summer before. And some of you may have participated in this research. And actually, two students from our group are coming today. And when they arrive here in about an hour, they're going to be sitting in the back of the room. So if you're interested in you know, donating a saliva sample uh, and uh, getting involved in our research. They'll be here and you can talk to us uh, about doing that. But we collected about 30 people who had CHD7 negative uh, charge syndrome and we found changes in other genes, not CHD7, that were considered causative for the features in those people. 
So this is a cartoon summarizing the work that we did around this uh, project. And perhaps not surprisingly, we found changes in genes that cause Kabuki syndrome. Some of you have probably heard of Kabuki syndrome. A lot of similarities to CHARGE syndrome, congenital heart disease, they have ocular coloboma, they have some craniofacial features that mimic CHARGE. So we weren't fully surprised by that. KMT2D is a Kabuki gene, KMT2D here. This is a cartoon essentially summarizing how we think these different genes may be working together. We also found a mutation in a gene called P300, which causes Rubenstein-Tabe syndrome. Again, it's a different syndrome, but there is some clinical overlap with CHARGE. We found, um, uh, this is another Kabuki gene, KMD, KDM6A. We found a mutation in a gene called RERE, which is involved in retinoic acid signaling. And to date, there are only 19 people in the world who have been identified as having changes in that gene. But if you look at them, you can see why someone thought they may have had CHARGE. So there is a lot of overlap. Another one is called PUF60, which causes Verhage syndrome, an extremely rare condition. There's one publication on that. And what fascinates me about this is these people technically don't have CHARGE syndrome. They have these other conditions that are defined by the genes that are changed in those conditions. So the deep, deeper we dig into the genetics of CHARGE syndrome, the more we learn about the overlap with other conditions, but we still have people who don't have a change in any one of these genes. And that's where that 99% of DNA that we don't understand, I think, is going to become more and more important. So we predicted, um, based on changes in all of these genes, that they might be causing similar clinical features by acting together in the nucleus. So that if you have a complex of proteins and you disrupt any one of them, you get similar features. Does that make sense? Yes? So is it possible that people that are clinically diagnosed could have one of those syndromes instead? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. And when people ask me, you know, why should I bother to have my child tested, you know, sequenced, the, what I say is if it becomes possible to um, treat any of these conditions, it's probably going to be important to know what the underlying change in your child is so that you can know whether that particular therapy is, is relevant to you. Um, there's no urgency in that, certainly. But the other thing it influences is your ability to compare you, know, you or your child with other people who have that same change. Because it does help in terms of understanding, predicting what your child may be at risk for, how to manage. Sometimes we learn specific therapies work better in some genetic conditions compared to others. And then there's always the, um, the conversation around other, other family members and what their risk or um, likelihood of having that same condition is. So that's what I usually tell families who ask, you know, what's the point of all this? Yes? Um, my son's 14. Mm -hmm. So I would say if you had genetic testing 14 years ago or even five years ago and it was negative, I would revisit the question with a geneticist. Because we can now look at all of the genes, those exons, in all of the genes, all 20,000 genes, and ask in one fell swoop which gene is affected, if any. And we have people, like we did in the, this paper that we published, if we do exome sequencing of all those 20,000 genes, and we don't find a change, which we have in several of our patients, um, then we'll reflex to whole genome sequencing, which is not yet clinically available, but it, it should be sometime soon. So absolutely, if you had testing 14 years ago and were negative, I would revisit the question because we can look at all of the genes at one time. Um, any other questions before we move on? How are we doing? Okay. So. Oh, yep. Sure. I heard the term at one point that the CHD7 gene is a building block gene. And, and have you ever heard that term, or is that something that's accurate? A building block gene? Yeah, like that's why it affects so many different, uh, like it's kind of one of the building blocks of life. Like it, that's why it affects so many different systems. I think, um, 
I haven't heard the term building block, but it is expressed very, very early. If you look at embryonic stem cells, which are derived from the blastocyst, which is very early embryo stage, like 32 cell stage, it's expressed very early. It's also expressed prior to implantation. So it is critical for multiple aspects of development that become, I guess, tissue specific as time goes by. If you look at the embryo and ask where is it expressed very early, it's quite widespread. But then as the embryo develops, the cells that maintain expression of CHD7 become more and more restricted. So I don't know if I would use the term building block, but it's certainly critical at those early stages for expression of multiple genes. Um, in ways that probably have to do with rearranging protein and chromatin in the nucleus. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So it, um, I'll take that opportunity to just expand on um, a difference between germline and mosaic mutations. When people talk about germline mutations, what they mean is that that change in the gene was present either in the egg or the sperm, the germ cells of the body, meaning that every cell in your body has that change because every cell in your body arose from the zygote, which is the cell that forms when the egg and the sperm come together, okay? So a germline mutation, you would expect to find anywhere you look, you take a hair, skin, muscle, anywhere you look, that change should be present. That germline mutation is different from what we would call a somatic, like body-related or mosaic mutation. You can imagine, you know, when the embryo forms, the zygote comes together, that zygote multiplies into two cells, which become four cells, which become eight cells, on and on to create the human body. If a mutation happens any time after the zygote stage, then only a subset of the cells in your body will be affected. That clonal relationship occurs because the cells that undergo the mutation divide and carry that mutation on into all of their progeny, their children, if you will. So there are conditions where, um, for example, in a different condition, neurofibromatosis type 1, we have patients who have neurofibromatosis type 1 in their left leg, and that's all they have. That's a somatic mutation. And we think that that can occur with CHD7. There's no reason to think it couldn't occur but we don't really have a good grasp on it because we would never advocate sequencing every cell in somebody's body to find out whether they were mosaic, right? We wouldn't do that. But you could test someone's saliva and blood and maybe do a skin biopsy if you thought that they might be mosaic for a change in CHD7, absolutely. And I, just, I think there are, I know there are publications of what's called germline mosaicism now, we're getting into the weeds a little bit, but germline mosaicism occurs when you have more than one person in your family affected with charge, but the parents are unaffected. That means that a subpopulation of eggs or sperm likely had that change, and that led to multiple individuals in the family being affected without either parent being affected. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, and that, that happens. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, let's move on to some of the research. And uh, again, I may get excited and off track here, so if I start speaking nonsense, just stop me. Um, we're going to talk about the mouse models of CHARGE syndrome. And we, I had actually uh, been doing work in mouse genetics before the CHD7 gene was identified. In fact, I'll never forget being at the American Society for Human Genetics meeting in 2004. And the very, this is a large meeting of geneticists from around the world, seven, 8,000 people. And the very first talk on the very first day was the report of the CHD7 gene. And I had been alerted to this by some colleagues in Europe that were working on it because they knew I was interested. And I was sitting in the front row, you know, almost in tears. And um, 
had been working in mouse genetics, and I said, okay, so we have to make some mice to understand this gene, and this is how we did it. This is a cartoon, again, showing you the structure of the CHD7 gene, not everything, but the critical pieces up here, these exons that I mentioned. What we did is we took that gene and we genetically engineered some junk DNA, pieces that didn't uh, belong there, upstream of the area that is necessary for turning it into RNA. I'm gonna call this the GT allele because it's gene trap, because we trapped the gene with this junk DNA. That junk DNA turned out to be really useful for this, I'll come back to this slide in a minute, but it allowed us to tag CHD7 in a way that would tell us where it's expressed. Because when you uncover a new gene and you don't know anything about it, one of the first questions you ask is, where is it expressed? In other words, where does that DNA get turned into RNA and protein? Because not every cell in the body expresses every gene. Most cells will only express a portion of the genes. Neurons express genes that are important for neuron development. They don't express genes that are necessary for muscle cells. Muscle cells express genes that are necessary for muscle cells. So one of the very first questions was, where is CHD7 expressed? Is it everywhere? And you only see features in charge because those tissues are more sensitive? Or is it really restricted to specific tissues? And this um, analysis was exciting because it showed us that if you look at a mouse embryo and you ask, where is CHD7 expressed? It's expressed in all the areas you would expect it to be knowing what you see in CHARGE syndrome. It's in the eye, in the retina, and the lens. It's in the olfactory bulb where we process our sense of smell. It's in the olfactory epithelium in the nose. It's in the developing limb. It's in the heart. It's in the kidney. It's in the gut nervous system. So getting back to the GI manifestations in charge, there it is. It's in the inner ear. So we took this as a, a challenge to dig deeper into the embryo and ask what CHD7 is doing in these various tissues. And before I tell you how, I did, how we did that, I just wanna go back to my cartoon because one of the predictions that we made was that in humans who have CHARGE syndrome, Everybody has two copies of CHD7, right? One that we got from our mom and one that we got from our dad. Regardless of who you are, that's how genetics works. You can't change that. So in CHARGE syndrome, only one of those copies is changed. You don't ever see in humans both copies being affected. And as a geneticist, what that suggests is that people who have both copies of the gene affected probably don't survive. That's the thinking anyway. And that probably is true, although it's never been proven in humans. In mice, you can look at that, and that's exactly what happens. In mice, if you look early during development, you can find embryos that have both copies of the gene affected, but they don't ever make it to be born, okay? That condition is called homozygous lethality because both copies are altered, and it leads to um, lack of survival. So humans are heterozygous, meaning different copies of the gene. They have one copy affected, one copy that's normal, and that's exactly true in mice as well. So this is like a geneticist dream, right? Everything you know about humans translates to mice, and you can ask really interesting questions about how the mice behave. Now, um, this cartoon shows that GT allele, which is, I'm gonna call the charge allele or gene form. When I say allele, I just mean that form of the gene. We took the wild type, turned it into a charge-like allele. But we also, knowing that the um, loss of both copies would likely lead to death, we made a, a copy of the gene that we could turn into a mutant gene. And we did that because we wanted to know what would happen if you completely get rid of CHD7 in mature tissues. It's essentially you know, a tool for us to understand what CHD7 is normally doing. And the way we did that is we engineered these two fancy DNA sites called LOXP sites right around the beginning of the, where the RNA is made. And then we can mate those mice with other mice to swap out that piece of DNA and turn it into a mutant allele. The details of this aren't important, except I want you to realize that what we're doing is manipulating the 
genes so that we can understand how CHD7 works when you lose half of it or whether you lose all of it in a very tissue specific way. Okay? So this wasn't uh, new technology, we just applied it to CHARGE syndrome at a time when nobody else had done it. Since then, other people have caught on. We've shared our mouse models with, um, I think, 20 labs around the world, and we've also deposited these mice in the Jackson Laboratory repository up in Maine so that anybody and their brother can use them whenever they want which is really nice because we were actively involved in collaborations, but at some point I decided, you know what, enough is enough. The Jackson Lab can have them and decide, you know, who gets to maintain them. This is a list that we put together for that issue I mentioned of all the different CHD7 mutant mouse strains. So many of them were spontaneous mutations that people found looking at um, what's called mutagenesis studies where you zap the DNA with something that's gonna change the sequence and then you screen the mice for circling behaviors. By the way, our mice circle in the mouse room. They run around in circles, they're very hyperactive. Um, yeah, it was very, very interesting. <laughs> and uh, so I don't know if you can read this, but some of the early mice that were described were actually identified by looking at mice with hyperactivity behaviors. They run around in circles, they bite their hand, you know. Um, and the, the terms that were applied to these mice were related to those hyperactivity behaviors. One is called tornado, whirligig, flouncer, eddy, lodo. And the groups that were studying these were people I already knew in the hearing research field who were looking for novel genes. So this was um, pretty interesting to follow this field. And I've just put squares around the mice that we made that we've now uh, deposited at the Jackson Laboratory. So this field has really exploded, partly because the tools became available uh, right at the time that people needed them. Now, when we elected to dedicate our energies into understanding CHARGE syndrome, um, I had been working already in neuroscience and, and the hearing research field, and I thought, well, we have to understand what CHD7 does in the ear, partly due to mouse costs. If you study a condition where most, mouse is a, most of the mice are affected, you don't have to generate as many mice, so it saves money. So it's part of the motivation. But it's also more satisfying to set up an experiment and look at the results and find something in most of your mice as opposed to 10% of them. So I'm kind of lazy. I wanted to just do what was going to yield results. And so we focused on the ear. And I'm really glad we did, because we've learned a lot about how CHD7 functions in the inner ear, which is starting now to translate to other tissues and organs. So let me just introduce the ear, um, because all parts of the ear are affected in CHARGE syndrome, the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. And you know, the outer part of the ear, as my husband would like to say, is not just for holding your glasses, right? It actually does participate in directing sound into your ear, um, and it's cartilage, and it comes from that part of the body or the nervous system called the neural crust. The neural crust is a population of cells which originate in your spinal cord and migrate all around the body. They participate in skin, um, craniofacial structures, heart development. For years, people thought CHARGE syndrome was a neurochristopathy. Well, it probably is, but it's a lot more than that. So anyway, the outer ear, as you know, can be affected with reductions in cartilage, with um, changes in the shape of the ear. Um, the middle part of the ear, that blue area, is really uh, an air-filled cavity which contains the middle ear bones, the incus, the malleus, and the stapes. So when the sound comes into the ear, it hits those middle ear bones, and the air gets converted, the, the vibrations of the sound get converted into a waveform. So that stapes is like a foot plate on a horse stirrup, and that stapes turns the air vibration, or the sound vibration, into a mechanical wave that pushes fluid into the blue part, that circular part called the cochlea. Now, sorry, I, don't, I can't really point to this, but up on the top you see those semicircular canals, those three orthogonal structures. Those structures are responsible for converting your sense of movement in three dimensions into sensory signals that get sent up to the brain. So changes in those semicircular canals can really affect how you hold your head, where you look, and your sense of balance. 
And we know that those structures are affected in charge syndrome. The snail structure called the cochlea mediates all of the auditory signals. So when the sound comes in, that stapes creates this mechanical wave, which is a fluid wave, that in the cochlea, that snail-shaped structure, pass the wave of fluid passes over the hair cells, and that gets converted to an electrical signal that then goes on to the brain. Okay, so what I wanna show you are some examples of our work looking at what the shape of the ear is in mice with charge syndrome. And the way we do this is we take mouse embryos and we fix them and we inject Benjamin Moore semi-gloss white paint into the inner ear, which is a fluid filled space. It's that blue part that I showed you in the cartoon there, that blue part. And right away, the fluid, face, uh, fluid filled cavity fills up with paint and you can see it. It's the most rewarding thing. It's like vacuuming the floor. You vacuum, the dirt goes away. Fill it up, look at it, score it, move on. And you can see here that once you fill, so again, on the, on the left is what the ear would look like without the paint. You can't really tell what's there. It's fleshy, there's no structure to it, but you fill it up with paint and voila. You see the semicircular canals, you see the cochlea. It's a very beautiful thing. Now, if you ask, how does that structure form and what does it look like during development? On the far left is what the inner ear looks like very early in development. It's essentially a fluid-filled ball. If you fill it with paint, you get a ball. Not very exciting. But over the course of several days, that little ball turns into this complicated structure that I just showed you with the semicircular canals and the cochlea at the bottom, okay, on the far right. So that far right thing is basically a mature-looking ear. Now, we did this in our mice and found I'm gonna to have to go over here to show you this. So on the left is what a normal ear would look like. In the middle is a charge ear in our mice. And what we find is that the lateral semicircular canal is always abnormal in some way. It's either short or it's truncated or it's narrow. And we've seen that in every mouse we've looked at so far. The column on the right, and these are just developmental stages, right? So mice, um, Mouse gestation is about 19 days, so we're looking at embryonic day 11, 12, and 13, sort of middle, middle to late middle during gestation. The column on the right is taken, those ears were taken from mice where we've knocked out that other copy of CHD7. So if you think of the mouse uh, in the middle as equivalent to a person with charge syndrome, the one on the right would be equivalent to someone who has no functional CHD7, but probably wouldn't have survived, okay? And the interesting thing about the ear on the right is it looks vastly different than the one in the middle because there basically are no semicircular canals and no cochlea. So that tells us right there that CHD7 is absolutely necessary for development of these canals and for development of the cochlea. And the question then becomes why and how is CHD7 so important? Now, if you were to read the medical literature about charge syndrome back in the late 80s, where it wasn't really known whether it was a genetic condition or not, you might have read papers that said, well, charge syndrome looks a lot like um, retinoic acid embryopathy. So when women were exposed to high levels of retinoic acid, which is now used as an anti-acne medication, Babies were being born with multiple congenital uh, or multiple birth defects. That's one of the reasons if you have a teenager in your house who uh, is treated for acne with Retin-A, they have to sign forms that uh, require them to not get pregnant. The FDA requires this uh, very regimented um, relationship between a physician and a teenager who takes Retin-A for acne, which is a fantastic medication. It works really well. But if you're pregnant, if you get pregnant while you're on Retin-A, the likelihood that you will have a child with birth defects is very high. So this, this um, relationship had already been known back in the late 80s. And when we realized this, we asked, okay, well, if, if Retin-A or vitamin A um, exposure leads to the same problems as you see with CHARGE syndrome, why is that? How is CHD7 functioning 
in retinoic acid metabolism and what can we learn from that? So um, we started looking at CHD7 and retinoic acid pathways. People knew that too much vitamin A or retin A could lead to birth defects, but also vitamin A deficiency leads to birth defects. So clearly titration of the amount of retinoic acid or vitamin A in your body is important for development of these multiple organs. What I'm showing in this slide is the biochemical pathway for vitamin A metabolism. So vitamin A gets converted to a chemical called retinaldehyde by these enzymes shown there, retinaldehyde dehydrogenases, and retinaldehyde gets converted to retinoic acid by another set of enzymes um, called uh, aldh 1 a 1A2 and 1A3. And citrol is um, a chemical that acts as an inhibitor of that last pathway. So we asked, could we influence what the ears look like in our mice by treating them either with retinoic acid or this particular inhibitor? Because we wanted to know which direction it might affect our mice um, in. Now, I'm just gonna take you through this slide and, because it shows you what we learned about this uh, experiment. So on the top, what you see is a normal mouse, untreated on the left. Again, these are paint fill images of our embryos. Untreated on the left, retinoic acid treated in the middle column, and then citrol on the right. So the top is the normal, and the bottom panels are the charged mutant mice. And essentially, if you look at the untreated, you see in the bottom left, the lateral canal is affected, like we would expect in our CHD7 mutant mice. If we treat them with retinoic acid in panel K, that middle panel on the bottom, it makes the ear worse. So that's consistent with this prediction that if you expose embryos to retinoic acid, it makes, you know, it leads to malformations. What was interesting about this experiment is when we treat with citrol, that inhibitor of that enzymatic pathway, we actually get a rescue of that inner ear. Not in every embryo, but in about um, a third of them, or two thirds, I think it was. At any rate, the fact that we got any rescue was surprising and interesting to us because it suggested that reducing retinoic acid exposure might lead to some rescue of these mutant mice. So pretty interesting, right? And if we don't treat them with citrol, we never see this rescue phenomenon. So that got us to thinking, well, why would it be, like, and how is this going to work? What genes is CHD7 affecting? So we started screening our mouse embryos for changes in genes that we know are important for retinoic acid. And I'll show you the one that we landed on as um, important. This gene, ALDH1A3, is one of those enzymes in that last pathway that converts retinaldehyde to retinoic acid. So in the ear, this enzyme is important for that last step of retinoic acid synthesis. And look what happens. What I'm showing you, these are sections through an embryonic ear from a normal mouse on the left, the charged mouse in the middle, and the um, mouse where there's no CHD7 on the right. And you don't see much of that enzyme in the wild type, in the normal, but it goes up when you get rid of CHD7 in a dose-dependent fashion. So um, we asked, hmm, you know, what does this mean? Does this mean that when you lose CHD7, this gene is upregulated, and could that be related to how CHD7 is unwinding the chromatin at that gene, and how important is this gene? Like, really, how important is it? So, we asked that question, again, genetically, because genetics is a really powerful way to, to do science. We took mice that had changes in that gene and crossed them. We mated them together with our mice. The prediction being that if we knock out or we get rid of that gene, we might also be able to rescue the CHD7 problems that occur, CHD7 related problems. And indeed, that's what we observed. So at the top here, are the changes in the gene that we see. So either normal LDH1A3, loss of one copy of LDH1A3, or loss of both copies, crossed with our mice that have lost that one copy of CHD7, okay? 
And it's important to realize, this is probably a, just a minutia detail, but mice with loss of one copy of that gene don't have any ear problems that we can tell. But when you mate them with our mice, again, you see a rescue in some fraction. In this case, it was about half of the embryos of those inner ear malformations. So this shows you that genetically, if you reduce that gene, you can also rescue the problems that occur with loss of CHD7. So we published this earlier in the year and predicted that this was a target gene of CHD7 that is normally downregulated by CHD7. So CHD7 turns on the brakes for this gene, says don't be expressed in the normal setting. When you lose CHD7, this gene goes up, and for reasons that we really don't understand, that leads to the problems in the semicircular canal. And there were uh, a variety of other things we had to do to prove that to ourselves and others, but we think that's what's happening in the ear. And I'm sure that's not the whole story. So for the last part of um, what I want to present, we still have time for some questions. There are so many questions uh, I couldn't even begin to tell you, but one of the ones that I'm really interested in is what is CHD7 doing in individual cells, okay? The technologies are becoming so powerful now that you can extract individual cells from tissues, embryos, humans, whatever source you're interested in, and you can sequence them. So you can ask questions like, how does expression of this particular gene in this particular cell at this particular time compare to another one? And it's opened up an entire field called single cell genetics and single cell analysis. And I was fortunate enough to have a sabbatical three years ago where I went to Stanford and worked with a colleague on this question. And I'm really excited because we now have a, a new paper that's uh, about to get accepted for a publication. And I just want to share with you what our thinking was going into this study and what we think we've learned from it. Now, um, this is a cartoon which is a crude, very crude simplification of what the ear looks like and how we think it develops. I mentioned earlier when I showed you those paint-filled pictures that if you inject paint into a developing embryonic ear very early, you'll just see a little white ball, right? So developmental biologists have been fascinated with this organ for years. You know, Dan worked on some of this when he was um, uh, at the NIH, I think, right, doing developmental biology of the inner ear. How is it that you can take a spherical structure like this and turn it into that complex organ with the three semicircular canals and the cochlea? It's fascinating what has to go right in order for that to occur. I mean, I'm, I'm shocked that any of us is ever born, frankly, because of the complexity of what has to happen for human biology to work, right? Well, back in 2002, Doris Wu and Donna Fekete wrote this beautiful paper describing what they perceived as patterning of the inner ear from that very early stage when it's still a simple sphere. So they defined three axes, the um, horizontal, vertical, and then longitudinal axis, and basically divided the sphere up into octants. So if you do that, you get you know, northeast, southwest, and the cartoon here is simply showing you color-coded which octant expresses which genes that they thought were important for development of that particular part of the ear. We know that the dorsal or upper part of the ear, that ball gives rise to the vestibular structures and the lower part gives rise to the auditory structures. So you could start to map onto this ball which genes were important for which structures. Okay, so far so good? Now, Stefan Heller and his group at Stanford published a, a beautiful paper back in 2015 showing that you could label the inner ear with a fluorescent tag. This is a picture of their embryo, and this is the otocyst, that little spherical structure here, glowing green. And you can do this with genetic uh, mouse models. This is a blow-up of that developing otocyst. And what they showed is that you could take these embryos, you could microdissect that little ear, take those cells, dissociate them from each other to a single cell suspension, put them through a machine that collects the cells in plates. So now you have a 96 well plate where each individual well has a single cell in it, and then do 
multiple gene expression assays on those individual cells. And when they did that, they could see, shown in that little square there, is the cells that are positive for the green tag, but negative for the red tag, which just tells you that those cells are the ones you want, basically. Okay. And when they did this, they were able to show that specific cells in regions of the ear have very distinct gene expression signatures. And when I saw this paper, and I was talking to Stefan about it, I said, oh my gosh, we have to do this on our mice. So, because I really want to know what are the genes that are truly sensitive to loss of CHD7 early in the ear development? Why is it that the lateral semicircular canal is so uniquely affected? Why is that? Um, so we shipped our mice to Stanford. I went on sabbatical. We generated this same experimental setup, but now asking, what does it look like in a normal situation and in a situation where you've lost one copy of CHD7? Now, before I show you the results, I will just say that we were predicting that we might observe changes in genes that are really important for semicircular canals, some of which we already know. That was my bias going into it. We're gonna learn you know, that this gene in this part of the ear is affected and that's gonna tell me why the semicircular canals are always affected in charge. Well, as often occurs in science, that didn't necessarily turn out, but this was the overall question. Does CHD7 influence patterns of gene expression in the developing ear? Does it target genes that are important for semicircular canal development? Does it target genes that are important for cochlear development? Or does it do something else? This is what some of the data look like. Um, and essentially, this is some quality control, but we had to do this over multiple litters of mice, generating multiple um, plates of cells. And we had to convince ourselves that there weren't any major differences across litters or across plates. So that's what some of this quality control is. And basically, if you look at what's called a principal component analysis plot, where each one of these individual dots represents a cell that came from an ear of an embryo, um, it shows you that there are sort of two groups appearing. This group up here is representative of cells that are neurons. These are cells that are gonna become part of the nervous system of the ear, whereas these cells uh, here in the bigger plot on the right are going to contribute to the structural components of the ear the cochlea, and the semicircular canals. So the quality control was really great, and we were happy with the quality of the data. And when um, the results came out, Robert Durthy Durthy in Stefan's lab called me and said, we have this fantastic result. It's telling us that the distribution, and I, it's really gonna be hard to do this without a pointer, but on the left with the wild type, in the upper left panel there, you see a, a group of cells that are red, and then another group of cells that are blue. Those group of cells that are red are the developing neurons. And if you look at the right set of panels, which are mutant, you can see more red dots than the panel on the left, okay? That tells you already that there appear to be more neurons in the ear cells that came from the mutant embryo as opposed to the normal one. And Robert called me and said, oh my gosh, this is really exciting. We have a result that suggests that there are more neurons in the developing ear of the charge mouse. And I said, what? <coughs> that makes no sense. Because we've already published that when you knock out CHD7 in the ear, you get fewer neurons. So we were really confused by that. But the data are the data, and they're beautiful. And we don't know yet what this means. But what it tells us is that CHD7 is probably functioning very early in the embryo, telling those cells whether to become neurons, or cells that make up the cochlea, or cells that make up the semicircular canal. So as much as I'd like to say I really understand this result, I don't. <laughs> but this is how it works, right? We have an observation, we're gonna publish it, we're gonna try to figure out what it means, um, and it's leading us down, to, down some really interesting paths. I'm gonna spend just a couple minutes on future directions and unanswered questions, because I'm uh, running out of time. But I hope I've shared with you the enthusiasm that we have around getting to the basic biology of charge syndrome and the belief that I have that when we do that, we could uncover potential novel ways of diagnosing charge syndrome, ways of treating it, and, uh, or, or at least ways of understanding it. Um, 
we've already talked about this question, uh, what is the full spectrum of human conditions associated with changes in the CHD7 gene? Could there be changes in CHD7 that we don't know about that explain other conditions not related to charge? There are people who have relatively nonspecific developmental delay, may have mild features of charge, have a change in the CHD7 gene. Is that change sufficient to explain their clinical features? There's a lot we don't yet understand. And some of that's going to require modeling of gene changes in animals, in cells, and truly understanding its function. I showed you what we learned about this aldh one a 3 gene in the inner ear. That's a very specific observation in a very specific tissue at a very specific point in development. You could imagine similar questions being asked in the heart, which people are looking at, in the brain. You know, pick your organ of interest. Are the target genes for CHD7 the same in every one of those tissues? Probably not. Are they different? How are they different? Why are they different? Is CHD7 doing the same things in all these different cells and tissues over developmental time or not? Um, how does CHD7 influence chromatin? There's some really exciting things going on to ask how CHD7 rearranges those nucleosomes that I mentioned, how it opens them up, how it closes them, how those chromatin states are inherited over time because when cells divide, all that chromatin architecture has to go away and come back. How does that occur? Is it different in muscle cells or neurons? Is it different in germ cells? I mean, it's fascinating. Can CHD7 activity be changed by drugs? You know, CHD7 is actually an enzyme because it requires ATP hydrolysis to change all those nucleosomes. Enzymes are often druggable. You know, that's a really interesting question. If CHD7 activity could be changed, would it be helpful for people with charge and how? These are questions we really don't know the answers to, but I think are fascinating uh, and worthy of our attention. I'm going to end by listing the many, many people that we collaborate with. Yoash Raphael is my uh, partner in life, my husband, my long-term collaborator, the father of my son, um, and I love him dearly, and you'll meet him at some of the charge meetings if you, if you come. Um, Stephanie Bilas and her students are the ones that are going to be here doing the recruitment of the human subjects. We have collaborations going on with uh, uh, investigators in human genetics. Phil Gage in ophthalmology is working on the eye features of CHARGE syndrome, which is an another exciting story. Um, and Tim, you'll appreciate this. Bo Duan is a biologist at Michigan who became interested in pain mechanisms. So he took our mice and is starting to assess how the mice are interpreting pain and tactile sensation. That's hopefully going to be an emerging story at some point in the future. And then we have collaborators uh, around the world. We've been fortunate to collaborate with uh, Richard Liu at Cincinnati Children's, um, Carlos Paris uh, in Paris. I like to say Carlos Paris in Paris. <laughs> Peter Scaccheri at Case Western, the group at Stanford that I briefly mentioned. We have colleagues at the NIH, um, a really good friend and colleague at Rutgers, and uh, Connie Van Ravensweig Arts, without saying, has been a real leader in this field, and her clinical expertise is uh, second to none. And this is my lab group. Um, we are uh, a motley crew of people that we, we have a lot of fun uh, in the lab. And, and um, some of these people you may have met. The woman on the left, Hui Yao, was one of the Davenport scholars at the last charge meeting. Um, uh, next to her on the right is Ford Hannum, a bioinformatics student. Elaine Ritter behind me uh, is a new postdoc in my lab. Yelka was at Stanford. She just joined my lab. Julia Eisenberg uh, in the middle there will be here in about an hour. Jennifer Skidmore on the right. And then on the far right is Vinod Belenbron, who's an undergrad. Um, actually, he's a new technician in the lab. Sorry. And we've been fortunate to have funding from the NIH, uh, NIDCD, the Taubman Institute. And uh, I do not have funding in my lab for um, our research on CHARGE syndrome, but they have been generous in supporting scientific conferences that we've been holding at Michigan um, for the past uh, couple of years. We had one in 2004, 2000, 2014, 2016, and we're going to hold another one this coming January. And the purpose of those conferences really has been to bring scientists together who are at the edge of CHARGE, you know, working in areas that we think are relevant to CHD7 who might not have been thinking about CHARGE. So we're trying to pull more people into this field. And I better stop with that. Thank you for your attention and take any questions.